Sir, let me begin by asking you, and before that, um, a very happy birthday. It's your birthday today. Tuam Jeeve Ma Sharda Shatam. May you live to be 100 years and a very happy and healthy 100 years, sir. Are we, are we a Hindu civilizational state and are we reclaiming it? To my mind, and I've uh, written my last book, is a book called The Great Hindu Civilization. So I have no doubt in my mind that we are a civilization and the mistake critics make is to try and conflate and understand civilization with a nation state. As you all know, a nation state in the modern sense as we know it was born only in the 17th century with the Treaty of Westphalia. Before that, people existed without the consciousness in a modern sense of a nation but they had a civilizational overlap that was verifiable. And as far as Hindu civilization goes, it goes back even to the period before the dawn of time. As you know, our history has been predated now by at least two millennium. Uh, with, with greater research, science, and every other tool at our command, we now know that the earlier theory that the Aryans came in sometime around 1500 BCE overwhelmed the Indus Valley civilization here, which is now treated as rubbish by all historians. Today that theory, which was a British creation, has been completely set aside and the antiquity of this civilization has been pushed back as a result of the research done largely on that elusive river called Saraswati. So we now go back to about at least 4000 BCE or not, if not more. So, so the so oldest surviving civilization and we have survived. And we have survived. Every survived. other civilization of that period has perished. And that is, of course, a tribute to the conquering eclecticism of this civilization. Of the Hindu civilization. So, is it time, Harsh, to claim it, to reclaim it? We are a secular country, but a Hindu civilization, and to own it. So, <clears throat> absolutely. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for having me. Thank you, Nehru today. Happy birthday, sir. <laughs> it's an you. honor to share the stage with you. Uh, Absolutely. See, we have to look at it in a larger perspective. As Sir was saying, the modern nation state was, you know, basically birthed with the Treaty of Westphalia. So before that, all quote-unquote pagan cultures, non-Abrahamic cultures, did not have a sense of the theological other. It is the it is the contribution of the Abrahamic uh, worldview organization, which led into conquering, converting people. Then further led to internal schisms. For example, Germany became Protestant, Iran became Shia. And in Europe that led to, after these intra-Christian civil wars, led to the modern nation state. It is in this context uh, that we have to see the Indian nation state, where of course partition happened, and Muslim majority areas separated in 1947. Even in 1971, when the so-called two-nation theory was drowned in the Bay of Bengal, it actually was not because nobody from Bangladesh wanted to join India and nobody from West Bengal wanted Bangladesh to join despite all uh, claims of great common Bengali cultural identity. So it is de facto a reality that the Indian nation state is very much a legacy of the Hindu dharmic civilization. Uh, now it is a Hindu Rashtra. Whether it is a Hindu Rajya or not depends on how you define the semantics of it. Okay. Ambassador, do you see it as a secular country, but a Hindu Rashtra. No, I am a little wary of the label Hindu Rashtra because it is exclusionist by definition, which Hinduism itself has not been. Let me go back because this question is important. Why is it that scholars of Hindu civilization like Amartya Sen or scholars of history like Ramana Thapa try to either avoid or debunk 
or even hostilely critique the notion of a Hindu civilization. What, Why? Denigrate in some instances? I don't think denigrate. I will not use the word because Amartya Sen is a scholar of Sanskrit. I once asked him, why have you not given up your Indian passport? You believe in multiple identities, you live abroad. Why, why the Indian passport? And he whispered to me over his glass of wine and said, you know, Pavan, I can't give it up. I learned Sanskrit. So the point I'm making is that there is a principal identity and they are aware of it. But why are they critical is because they do not want in today's milieu for political and perhaps valid reasons to accept the greatness of a civilization and its multifaceted achievements, not without blemishes, but nevertheless refinements which are beyond imagination. Because they look at it as glorification of a Hindu past, which means by de definition exclusion of a modern secular republic and the other faiths who live in our country. No, but is that actually true? I mean, if you glorify your Hindu past, are you excluding the others? So I respectfully disagree with uh, Pavanji here. I think obviously, you know, if you are proud of the Hindu civilization, it is the Hindu Rashtra. Uh, Hindu Rashtra is not exclusive in any way whatsoever because what is Hinduism? We need to first define these terms. Hinduism to me is a subset of dharma. Dharma is universalist. It is a subset of dharma which overlaps with Bharatiya Sanskriti. It is simply the local idiomatic expression of universalist dharma. Uh, in India, we never have minority problems with the Parsis. We never have minority problem with the Jains. We never have minority problems uh, with the Jews. Uh, for example, they do not proselytize even though they are Brahmic. So we actually have a minority problem where there is aggressive uh, tendencies to convert or to be different about accepting nationality wholesale. You know, Muhammad Iqbal famously said, in Taza Khudao mein sabse bada vatan hai, jo pehran iska hai, wo mazhab ka kafan hai. So the point there is, they refuse to accept the nation state in an ideological sense because that goes against the unity of Ummah. And you have Christian, Christian analogies of that as well, although Christianity has evolved a lot, a lot in the last couple of centuries. So there is a fundamental problem, there is a fundamental tension at the acceptance of the Indian nation state by the two universalizing, homogenizing Abrahamic religions. And we have to talk about it openly because otherwise there is no sense of this conversation. Okay. Ambassador, if, if the Hindu religion or the Hindu way of life talks about Vasudeva Kutumbukam, how is it excluding anyone, sir? First of all, when you say Hindu Rashtra, if your meaning is in a civilizational sense, that in this consecrated land, there has been a verifiable civilization for millennia, and which has identifiable traits, I can accept it. My problem is when we take a label of this nature and as Harsh was saying, try to see it as a point of conflict between Hinduism and that of the other faiths. He mentioned the Parsis. Naturally, numerically, they are a very small minority. Now you have 200 million Muslims in this country. I think we need to take the path whereby we recognize a great past and a great civilization which was glossed over in the decades after 47. And there are reasons for it. We need to go beyond that, but not go so far as to say that now, as a monolith, this nation is only Hindu. Because that goes against the tenets of Hindu. You began your introduction by saying, Ekam Sat Vipraha Bauda Vadanti. The truth is one, wise people call it by different names. You said, there are others, Ano Bhadra, Trithavantu, Vishrita. Let good thoughts flow to me from all directions. Hinduism, in fact, that's the reason why Wendy Doniger says, mistakenly, that it's a cross between a tortoise and an armadillo. She actually says this. Yeah. And the conceit, the misguided conceit and the unforgivable ignorance of the British who feel they created India is another contributing factor. People don't understand, or Abrahamic faiths find it difficult to understand,
the natural diversity within Hinduism within a framework of rock solid unity. That is called by Professor Rajiv Malhotra chaos anxiety. We don't have a Bible. We don't have one church. We don't have one God. We don't have one prescribed ritual. We have six systems of Hindu philosophy. And each of them can technically be called atheist. They are not talking of God. They are talking about what could be the ultimate truth behind the bewildering plurality of this cosmos. So therefore Hinduism has always proceeded as a mighty stream with tributaries joining and getting absorbed into it and with the mighty stream benefiting from but those tributaries. You know, that's a very interesting I point that you brought out. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, sir, for making the case better than I could have that a Hindu Rashtra cannot possibly be monolithic. If these are the key tenets of Hinduism, I cannot possibly see a scenario in which it would be monolithic. Under no RSS, BJP vision are we asked to worship only one god, are we asked to follow only one sampradaya, follow only one panth, listen to only one guru, follow only one of those six astic or nastic schools. So I am trying to understand what is the straw man that we are attacking here which does not exist in the very first place. I, I'll tell it you, is a valid question, would you agree? May, may, may I answer kindly? You see, when Hindu Rashtra is in the hands of Harsh, I am a little more assured. But today... The right man in the wrong party kind of thing, it, it never gets old, but it's not true. Let, let me, let me just I will be the wrong man 20 years from now. Uh, let me just finish. But today, because of the politicization of the reclaiming of, legitimate reclaiming of a great civilization, I think very often, the notion itself is passed into those, if you lock up in a room as they seek to violently protect Hinduism, if you lock them in a room and ask them to write a one-page essay on Hinduism, I guarantee you they'll fail. But in, in other words, in other words, other words, in other words I, what I'm saying is that when it is used in a political sense, then instead of following the precepts of Hinduism, which is not a monolith, you are actually creating points of friction in a modern secular republic where the minorities cannot be wished away. Now that does no, not diminish who wants to wish away the minorities is see, my point. See, Hindu does anybody want to wish away minorities? I, I, as I was saying, it's a straw man, it's the right question. See, Hinduism per se is political. When I am doing a Mahamrityunjaya Mantra 108 times, I am worshipping Shiva. The word Hindu has no meaning, no connotation at that point of time. The very existence of the word Hindu is per se political. We must understand it, which is why the differentiation between Hinduism and Hindutva is a false binary. The, I am being made conscious of my non-Abrahamic status in a largely Abrahamic world. The word obviously came first in the 13th century uh, to differentiate from the Turshukas, the Turkic Muslim invaders. The word ism was added in the early 19th century apparently by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, became Hinduism. The word Hindu by definition makes me understand that Gaurav and Pavan and Harsh all belong to this large capacious umbrella, common end of religions, even though we might worship completely different gods. So if the word Hinduism has to be political, sir. The word Hinduism cannot possibly have theological and spiritual connotations because no Hindu text, no Shruti or even earlier Smritis mentions the word. It has to be political. It must be seen in a constructive sense. You see, when you say political, very often people say that there was no such word as Hindu. But Megasthenes, when he came to the court of Chandragupta Maurya in the 4th century BCE, clearly refers to Hindus. In other words, a people conscious of their civilizational status may not have a word to describe themselves, but they are aware of the concept and very often that word is given by outsiders, be it the Persians, be it the Chinese, be it the Arabs. So therefore Hindus were not conceived in my sense of the term, and Harsha is a knowledgeable man, as a political entity. They were conceived as a cultural entity where a great religion, which could say, Aham Brahmasmi, Tat Tom Asi, 
I am Atma Brahm. A religion of this nature also built in parallel a great civilization with refinements in the field of music, of dance, of architecture, of science, of a worldview. And yet in today's day and age, you know, when you, when you talk about this from 4th century BC and predating that too, you said in today's day and age, most, of, most people in our country won't be able to write one page. Why is it that we are such a great civilization and our people know nothing, our own people know nothing of it? Is it because of these Turkic invasions, as you call it, uh, you know, from 10th century AD to 200 years of British rule and even post-1947, we are made to feel ashamed of our own dharm, of our own culture, and whatever the Brits teach us is the best. So therefore, if I may just answer, no, you see, you have to recognize the past. This attempt to gloss over the extent of sheer destruction of the artifacts and centers of learning of Hindu civilization with the coming of the Turkic invas invasions was glossed over. I say glossed over or undervalued in the aftermath of 1947 and the partition for well-intentioned reasons, but it has created a backlash because almost our historical textbooks made out that the invaders came in a tourist bus, they offered us some biryani, we gave them some puri alu and a Ganga Jamuna Tezi built up. It didn't happen like that. There was massive destruction. Will Durant writes that it is one of the most bloody chapters in world history. Bloodiest chapter in world history. So there was destruction. The greatness of Hindu civilization and Hinduism is that unlike many other countries like for instance Indonesia, in Hinduism survived by escaping from the crevices of the cage. It went to the masses through the bhakti movement and became a powerful movement not needing necessarily a leadership in the old sense but among the people. It survived because of the political awareness of this civilization and culture being separate in many ways orthogonal to the Abrahamic proselytizing culture. Like Shivaji talked about Hindavi Swarajya explicitly opposing the Turshuka Raj, wanting to reclaim Ayodhya, Kashi, Mathura. So there was, whether we call it cultural or political, it's a difference or a distinction. It was very much a political awareness of this dharmic civilization being under attack, maybe for multiple motives, but one of the motives being religious motives. So I agree again with you what you are saying, sir, but then therefore to say it is not political is, as I said, is just accepting it but without saying so. No. And sir, when, when Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj was also trying to reclaim Ayodhya, Mathura, Kashi, if that effort is made today, why should it be seen as wrong? Why should there be, in your view, perhaps a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, find out what went wrong and how to set it right? I'll just answer that question, but first what you asked. What the British did, the great success of British rule was, not the physical subjugation of India. It was a colonization of our mind. And that political freedom can come in 1947, the cultural colonization takes decades to go. And we have not made a serious effort to interrogate it and a serious effort without xenophobia and chauvinism to again resuscitate the greatness of many aspects of our past. So that's a weakness, and which no government has done so far appropriately. Okay. Now to your question. Of course, of course Kashi, apart from Ayodhya, as, as per available historical evidence, Aurangzeb built the mosque at the very spot of the Vishwanath temple. And it is one of the twelve Jyotirlings. In fact, later, Ahilyabai of Indore had that sanctum sanctorum shifted in order to establish the mosque. And perhaps much of the same happened in Mathura. The point is this. Ayodhya, we have a Supreme Court judgment. How long can you rectify the historical 
a as, source of the as past, long as it takes. No, a source of the past by creating endemic instability today because ultimately the past can be recognized, can be resolved through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Okay. But as Mohan Bhagwat ji asked, if the entire country goes about looking for a mosque under every temple, Shilling what under. is going to happen to India? Okay. okay. I, 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 hush. I, know, I just want to yeah. answer some points to her said. Okay. Mohan Bhagwat ji was right to say, please don't look for a shivling under every mosque. But that does not mean that the known, accepted mandirs which were destroyed deliberately based on religious hatred and mosques were built on top of that should not be reclaimed. There is, there is no statute of limitations on that in a civilizational sense. We have every right, indeed responsibility, to reclaim every single one of them. And my point is, uh, on what basis will that create tensions? It can only create tensions if there is a supremacist residue still remaining. If you know that this was wrongly destroyed and then my place of worship was built on that, it is only natural and generous in a human spirit, in a humane spirit to offer it. Should it not? Should that not be the default expectation? Are we not indulging in the soft bigotry of low expectations by saying some people will get violent if you just ask for what is fair and reasonable? Now, once that is offered, let me humbly submit, it is Hindu civilization's generosity that they will draw the line earlier than what people say. But to beforehand say that you can only go so far and no further, that this Places of Worship Act, which is, cannot be part of the basic structure doctrine, this is the final line, that cannot be in principle accepted. Now, Hindu culture, Hindu civilization may say, okay, this is enough, because we notice that there is no residual of supremacism left. But it, that cannot be imposed on us in saying that if you do not agree, you are ipso facto barbarian or bigoted. That has to be our decision, not the decision of the party who actually did those offenses. So that principle needs to be established. Okay, so this, my only counter to this is, if you begin to rectify what needs to be rectified of what was done wrong in the past, it's very difficult to stop this uncontrolled train. No, but that's why no, truth and reconciliation... That, that's, no, that, that could be an answer. So if everyone begins to seek legitimization today or rectification today of what was done wrong in the past, then it is not only the rectification which is very difficult to achieve in a full sense, but the collateral consequences of that I mean, India today had done a survey during the Babri Masjid at that time. And if I'm not mistaken, a majority of the respondents said, Ki bhai, mandir bane ya mosque bane, mandir ban jaye to achya hai, hame to hospital, school, naukri, dhanda, you know the traders... Ab to humara bhaat 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 these kind of situations can prove, uh, go ahead in a parallel basis in perpetuity. There are, there, are, there are priorities and there are reasons to accept. In a modern nation, the tolerance that needs to be given, not to minuscule minorities which you can overrun, by minorities that have become a part of your country's fabric and exist in numbers, where they cannot be either erased or thrown into I the must, I must respond to that. So sir. therefore I am saying, I, I make a plea for sanity. I believe that much more needs to be done to recognize the validity of this civilization of the past. It needs to become part of educational curriculums if it is not tinged with xenophobia. I just want to yeah. quick, quickly say that, you know, we do uh, truth and reconciliation on the axis of caste. We have affirmative action for sins and victimhood that was created pre-1947. There is no way that religion is a different axis. So if we can do it on caste, we can do it on religion as well. It is, all depends on the generosity of the two parties involved. The generosity of, of our... I will just end. Kush. Yes. The reason why India survives today as a nation, with, as a multicultural, plural nation, is what was said as a verity, kuch baat hai ki hasti mitti nahi hawari, barso raha hai dushman, dore jahaan hamara.
Thank couldn't you. have concluded it better. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this uh, extremely, extremely interesting session, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.